my name is Kathy Fitzpatrick. I am the program coordinator here at the Rochester Hills Museum at Van Hoosen Farm. So it's great to see everybody on here today. Um, and tonight I have the honor of hosting our women's history presentation. We have special guests with us here from the Mackinac State Historic Park System. Um, but this museum has a strong history of women in the greater Rochester area. Um, we have the history of Dr. Bertha Van Hoosen Jones, the founder of the American Medical Women's Association. We have Sarah Van Hoosen uh, Jones, who was actually a master farmer, one of the first female in her field. We have Alice Van Hoosen Jones, who was actually a Greek and Latin teacher, and one of the first graduates from the University of Michigan. So along with their stories that we tell really loud here at the museum, because this was actually their farm and their farmhouse, there are many more stories of women here in Rochester that we've been trying to explore and celebrate um, during Women's History Month here. So without further ado, I am going to hand it off to our presenters. Um, Craig Wilson and Leanne Ewart of the Mackinac State Historic Parks. Thank you so much. Yeah. All right. Well, I'll let Craig introduce himself and I'll see if I can manage the screen sharing. Well, I can do it from this end, Leanne. Oh, that would be fabulous. Yeah. Craig is a little more experienced on the technology than I am, although he is muted currently. Thank you. <laughs> um, <laughs> we're off to a great start. Uh, I, I was actually just dealing with a lost dog at the fort, so it's been a fun evening. Uh, but uh, in any case, yeah, my name is Craig Wilson. I'm the chief curator for Mackinac State Historic Parks, and I'm joined by uh, Leanne Ewer, who's actually going to be doing the bulk of this presentation tonight. But we were gonna. We decided to tag team it um, and talk a little bit about our interpretive style here at Mackinac in general. And then Leanne's gonna take a really deep dive into the interpretation of uh, a variety of different women who were living and working here at Michelin Mackinac in the 18th century. So I guess I'm gonna start to share my screen. All right, so there we go. Minor technical difficulties, but uh, in any case, yeah. So uh, we're gonna be talking not only about some specific stories of women at Michelin Mackinac, but also about our process of just doing interpretation uh, and how do we share those stories of those women and some of the other people who were here at Mackinac historically. So I guess what, like I said, I'm gonna do, I'm just gonna provide a little bit of background uh, about the site and about what we do here at Mackinac uh, as part of the Mackinac State Historic Parks. And so we're going to be talking specifically about Michelin Mackinac. And this is uh, basically where Mackinac City is today. That's where Leanne and I are right now. Um, and Michelin Mackinac was a fortified fur trading community that was built around 1715 just west of the Mackinac Bridge. Our visitor center where you actually enter the site today is literally built into the foundations of the bridge. What you see here is a drawing of what the Ford and community would have looked like in about 1765. And as Leanne and I talk tonight, you might hear us say fort a whole lot um, because that's our kind of convenient shorthand for the site today. It's so much more than that. It's not just a military outpost. Um, it truly is a fortified town, very much in like the European model. Um, and it's all here because of the fur trade. The Great Lakes fur trade is the economic driver of Michigan for about two centuries, and Mackinac is a center of that. Uh, and Michelin Mackinac specifically is a transshipment point. So you can think about the community here like any sort of logistical center today. So like a UPS warehouse or an Amazon warehouse, things come in on a truck, they get unloaded, they get sorted, they get loaded off on another vehicle uh, so they can be forwarded onto their destination. The difference is just back in the 18th century when we're talking about the vehicles were mostly canoes. Um, but Michelin Mackinac again serves as, as that transshipment point. It's a collection point for 
all sorts of furs that are coming out of the west, so the west side of Lake Michigan, out into Wisconsin, Minnesota, up uh, north of Lake Superior into Canada. Those furs are all consolidated here and then shipped back east to Montreal and ultimately over to Europe, where they can be utilized primarily in the fashion industry, primarily for, uh, for hats. So uh, the first Europeans out here were French. Obviously, there were indigenous people here before that. The Anishinaabek and other people were here, and Leanne will talk about them a little bit later. Um, but the first Europeans out here were the French. Uh, so they built this community. They expanded it several times. This whole region came under British control uh, in 1760, 1761. Uh, it kind of reached its greatest extent under British control. But then about 15 years later, beginning in 1779, as a result of the American Revolution, everything you see on the screen here was pretty much taken apart and moved over to Mackinac Island where it was reassembled. Uh, and that's how we get that community over on Mackinac Island that is still there today. Uh, so most of the buildings were taken apart and moved. Anything that wasn't moved got burned down. Uh, the British didn't want to leave anything behind that could potentially be used against them. And then this site basically just sat for uh, well over a century, but no one ever really forgot that the community was here. It's not a lost city or anything like that. Uh, and as a result, when Mackinac City was first platted in the 1850s, and then when people actually started you know, moving here in the 1870s, the site of Michelin-Mackinac was always set aside as a park, and that was really beneficial to us. Uh, and it was actually designated a state park in 1909. It's the second state park. Uh, and uh, it came under the administration of the Mackinac Island State Park Commission, which is our governing body still today. Uh, and in 1959, the Park Commission decided to start doing archaeology at the site, and that has provided a boon to us. And again, Leanne will talk a little bit more about that later. So Michelin Mackinac today, uh, we have reconstructed it. For those of you who have been here, you've, you've walked inside our, our reconstructed palisades, see the reconstructed buildings, and we're reconstructing it to the mid to late 1770s. So that map on the last page was just a few years before the time period that we're talking about today. Uh, and we're interpreting the Revolutionary War era. Uh, as, as time went on, uh, this community remained very much a civilian community, but it took on an in increased importance for the British war effort on both an economic front and a diplomatic front, as well as a strategic front. Uh, and we're interpreting all of that. And when I say all of that, I do mean that we're, we're focusing on the entire community because there were always more than soldiers living here. Soldiers were always the minority population. In the 1770s, there's maybe 60 to 80 soldiers living here. There would have been a few hundred civilians living here permanently. And then in the summertime, there'd be a much larger transient population, uh, maybe one to 2,000 people here just living here seasonally. Uh, in, in our interpretation today, we try and talk about all those people. So we're talking about the, the British soldiers, the French Canadian and British merchants and their families. They were both men and women acting as merchants as Leanne will discuss here in a little while. Uh, talking about the indigenous people in the region. Uh, again, the, the, our, our primary native people still today are the Anishinaabek. They are the native people of Michigan. Uh, but there were indigenous people coming from all over the Western Great Lakes uh, and gathering here at Michelin-Mackinac to trade and for diplomacy and to uh, join up with uh, military efforts. So we're trying to talk about all of those people, uh, as well as the enslaved population here. There's a pretty sizable group of people held in bondage here, mostly indigenous people. There were also some enslaved people of African descent. Uh, and so we try and talk about them as well. So again, to try and talk about the entire community here to give a more complete and holistic vision. Uh, and our interpretation takes many forms. Uh, I'm sorry if there's a bunch of stuff popping up on your screens as I move my mouse around here. Uh, we do demonstrations of very formal things like firing the cannon. Uh, we have tours where we lead people around the fort talking about a variety of different subjects. We have tours focused on, on the fur trade and the people who are involved in it. Uh, tours focused on the gardens and food, foodways and food culture. We have uh, a tour focused on the enslaved community. Uh, every year, we also have a different new tour focusing on a different year of the American Revolution. So this year in 2021, 
We're talking about the year 1778. Uh, and then we also have a lot of just informal interactions. Uh, you know, walk up to an interpreter and just start chatting with them, ask them questions. Um, and that's probably one of the most productive things that we can do. In non-COVID times, we also have sit-down programs where people come into some of the buildings and we talk about food or we have some sort of demonstration that we do inside. We've curtailed those for the moment. Uh, but our focus really is on the larger context and, and wider relationships, making things relevant to people today. You know, because what, what does Michelin Akinaw mean to someone in 2021? Well, there's a lot if you start to dig just a little bit and you try and build those connections. And all of our interpretation is really research-based. Um, that's a big part of what both Leanne and I do in the off season in the winter time is conduct that research to inform our programs. Because even though the fort isn't open right now, we don't get a day off. Uh, there's a lot of work that has to, has to happen. Um, and we really try and utilize some diverse sources so we can help our staff, which is usually 10 to 12 people, um, tell these, these diverse stories and really make good connections with our visitors. And to give you a, a really, um, I guess, in-depth example of that, I'm gonna stop talking at this point and I'm gonna turn things over to Leanne who is going to take it from here. And so I guess, Leanne, if you just want to uh, tell me when you need the next slide, I will advance them. Thank you, Craig. I appreciate the lovely introduction, very clear and concise. Um, but Craig introduced himself at the beginning quite, uh, quite nicely. Um, again, my name's Leanne and I've been with the park since, off and on since about 2007. And my job has changed quite a lot. Um, right now, I do help out, as he said, a lot with research and some of the behind the scenes things. I also spend a lot of time with the public, so actually presenting the information. And right now, we're also doing virtual programs, not very much unlike this one. So we're, we're constantly learning and constantly trying to figure out how to present the material and what makes the most sense for our audience. But I'm just going to talk a little bit first about my approach to it. Um, there are some, some challenges to interpreting in 18th century clothing as a woman, as I'm sure you can imagine, um, but we try to overcome those challenges and really focus on talking about the history of our site as a whole and emphasizing that that history is always very nuanced. We will never know everything. We will never be able to tell the, all of the bits of the stories. So. For me, it's really important to not talk in absolutes and to um, try to try to stick to the facts, I guess. And we'll talk about that a little bit more. Um, but right now, um, we are doing a lot of programs with children. And so I like to ask the kids when I start, especially a women's program, what do you think of when you think of women's roles in the past? I think you can imagine the answers that I get. Um, we get a lot of people saying, oh, women were cooking. Um, women were taking care of babies. They were gardening. And for us, it's really important to also recognize that, yes, absolutely, people think that for a reason, but also they're doing quite a lot. And I think you really described at the beginning quite well uh, the ladies that are important to your area. Um, and I, I really want to let people know that once they dig just a little bit below the surface, they're going to find that women are doing more than cooking and cleaning. So um, we try to ask these questions. Um, I also like to talk to people about why we should study women's history. When we do the women's tours at the fort, we, <laughs> Craig, you were right, we do say the fort quite a bit. Um, but when we do these programs at the fort, um, quite often I'm interested in the audience. So who is coming to these programs? If there's a family with moms and daughters, they're probably going to come on it. If it's a single man, maybe, maybe not. So I really wanna try in all of our programs to let people know that we're studying women's history because it's everyone's history. Women's history is human history. So we really try to get that out there for our public. and. For, for even myself and Craig, we're constantly trying to think about where we're coming from. 
what are, what are the biases that we're coming to the table with? Um, when I was putting bits of this slideshow together, I realized that I'm using pictures of people that look like me. So when we get through this picture, this, this slideshow, if you think about the pictures, you know, we, whether we're thinking about it or not, even as historians, sometimes we have to really make sure that we're reminding ourselves to look at that and be aware of it. So, but some of the sources um, that we do look at when we're looking at women and Craig, if you would like to advance, please. Um, we really are trying to look at those primary sources. Michelin Mackinac is rich, I would say, in primary sources. Of course, we always want more, but we have a number of maps that were drawn in the period um, that, like this one that you can see on the page, actually list the names of the people that lived in the houses at Michelin Mackinac. So for one very small snapshot in time, we have that information. We have that exact information, which is really special. Um, we also have a number of journals that have survived from the 18th century. Um, folks like uh, Peter Pond and um, Alexander Henry, uh, John Askin, these people were writing down their experiences that they were having right at the fort. They might not exactly be writing about women, but we can sometimes find women in their descriptions. Um, we have the military records. Uh, we have business records. So what are people buying and selling? We have vouchers that have survived. We have women's signatures on some of the paperwork. Um, we, we have those, uh, those sorts of written records. We also, as Craig mentioned earlier, have a fabulous archeology span program. Now there's no guarantee that specific items can be attributed to women in archaeology as much as we would like. Sometimes we can assume, you know, we find um, very small finger rings or we find um, uh, other bits of jewelry or maybe a shoe sole, um, something like that. But the archaeology we can piece together and get a picture of what the site is, what, what activities are happening at the site. So we do have that resource. Um, and then we also have our oral history traditions that are coming to us from the Odawa, the Ojibwa, and the Potawatomi. And those really can tell us a lot about what those communities that are outside of Michelinacanal were like. Um, so I think we're, we're going to start talking about women in the 18th century with them because they were here first. Um, when I started studying this, I guess I didn't, hadn't really thought about it as much as maybe I do now. Um, the more you learn, the more you're intrigued, right? Um, but women in Odawa and Ojibwa and Potawatomi communities in Michigan and in the Great Lakes are doing so much work for their families. Um, before the fur trade moved in, they're basically providing for all of the material needs of their families. So if you think about that for a second, that's your food, your clothes, your housing, that's um, any storage containers that you might need. That's, that's quite a lot. Um, they had, we know that they're processing furs. We know that they're making clothing. Um, they're both foraging for food and also growing food. And we'll talk about it a little bit more, but the corn that Native women were growing in Michigan was so important to the fur trade, to the success of the fur trade. It becomes important in some instances for the military as well. And in Anishinaabe communities, men are not the gardeners, which I love to talk about that to the kids. It's, you know, we, we've got this image in our minds of the farmers being these I don't know, big fellas out there behind the plow, but in these communities, it's women that are growing a large, the largest portions of the food. Um, so they're really doing all that work, even before the French and the British show up. But as the fur trade starts to move in, um, and we see that happening, the fort is established in about 1715. Of course, there were fur traders um, and other folks coming in before that, but as the fur trade comes in, we could move on to the next one, I think, Craig. Um, we start to see their roles in their communities changing. So there's this big economic enterprise that moves in. Um, the, as Craig talked about in the beginning, these, these merchants start bringing in things to sell for furs. 
in individual indigenous communities, women now, um, once the fur trade comes in, they start working in different ways. Um, there were, I don't know if I want to say new opportunities, but there were new roles that needed to be filled and they were filling them. Absolutely. Women were working as translators. Um, I found multiple instances where native women are working for the government. They might be working for the French government, later the British government, the American government. They're getting paid. Um, indigenous women are getting paid to work as translators. And that role is really important. They're the ones that are explaining things from one language to the next. Um, and I am fascinated by that. And I think there's a lot more research to be done there. They work as guides traveling from Montreal to Michilimackinac or from Michilimackinac into the interior. You have to know where you're going. Um, they work as guides in some of these canoes with some of these crews, even up into the 19th century. You know, we think of the most famous uh, guide traveling with Lewis and Clark, Sacagawea or Sacagawea. She's doing that work. She's the most well known. There were a lot of women also that were working in that role. They're also, of course, becoming consumers. Um, women in Native communities are the ones that are largely driving the goods that were coming out. We sometimes overlook the fact that the Odawa and Ojibwa and Potawatomi people, as well as many other Native nations, they wanted specific items. If the fur traders and the merchants did not bring them what they wanted, they would reject it. Um, they were quite savvy. You know, we today check the Amazon reviews, so why wouldn't they? They knew what they wanted. They were, they were very, um, very adamant about getting what they wanted. And I can think of one particular instance where a fur trader writes back to his agent who's stationed in Montreal and says, why the heck did you send me those blankets? They're the wrong color. I'm never going to be able to sell them. So these community men is men were driving this as well, but um, women who are largely responsible for making a lot of the clothing, which textiles made up over half of what was brought out to places like Michilimackinac, they're the ones that are like, hey, I want the good stuff. So I really like that idea or that fact, I guess, that they were consumers and helping to drive that fur trade economy. Um, they're also I mentioned earlier producing a lot of corn. Um, they're growing a lot of the food. Um, they make moccasins. I know um, one historian has written a little bit about how there was a moccasin production um, sort of on a large scale happening in Detroit. Um, there were women that are making these moccasins and, and selling them to these fur traders. Um, there's a little bit more that she wrote about but they're producing things that were used for the fur trade. And that is a big part of why the fur trade was so successful. They have these people that can kind of fill in all these tangential roles, these roles outside. Um, and then the, the biggest thing, the biggest way that indigenous women's lives change with the fur trade is that their families start to look different. So one of the one of the things that I think is important when we're talking about any sort of history is to, when we can, talk about specific people. Um, so we're going to talk a little bit about one of the specific people that we know were, was at Michilimackinac. Um, this woman's name was Marie. Um, Ms. Cash, she was Odawa. We don't know exactly what her Odawa name was, but this is the name that's recorded in the church records. Um, and when we're talking about her or any of the other women, um, we want to really think about um, what words or what terms we apply to them. You know, it's easy to say, oh, she was Odawa. And sometimes we extrapolate that when we say, oh, she was Native. Oh, you know, she was this, she was that. But what would she have called herself? So it's important to, if we can, use the same language it's appropriate um, that they were using. Sometimes we, um, I included this little little clip from a historian named Mintz. Um, he very clearly said that when we're talking about 
the process, I talked about families earlier, right? Um, as the fur trade moves in, um, families start to change, the look of them changes. Um, when indigenous people like Marie married French fur traders, their children um, are different than any children that had been in the Great Lakes before. They're coming from a background that is both French and Odawa in this case. So today we often say that they were, well, not often, it's changing, um, but people might use the term Métis, but that's not what they would have been calling themselves um, necessarily. And what we're finding in some instances, and Craig might be able to talk more about this, is that folks flowed from one community to the next. Marie had six children after marrying a French fur trader and those children um, spent time in their French communities. They also spent time in their native communities. So there's no, um, there's no good way, I think, of simplifying that. And that's a really important thing for us to talk or to, to try to get across when we're talking to the public is, you know, we, we, we don't want to simplify it. And that goes back to that thing where we want our history to be nuanced. But um, the reason that I chose to talk about Marie is because she was married um, at Michelin Mackinac and she had six children and two of those children are pretty well known. Um, you might have heard of Therese Schindler or Madeleine or Magdalene Laframbois. They were both very successful fur traders. Marie, out of all those six children, um, you know, she kind of set them up for success in the fur trade. Um, she was in a great position for that. So, but I, I like to, to talk about her and to really remind folks that um, we should be referring to people how they would have referred to themselves. And sometimes we don't know what that would have been. So, um, but Native women, their families change, the roles that they have in their communities change, and their focus in some ways also changes. Um, the French were at Michilimackinac from, the French military were at Michilimackinac from about 1715 to 1761. And then the British moved in. The British government took over the trade policies. They changed some of those. Um, they also changed a few other things that had a huge impact on a lot of the native people's lives. Um, and it's important to recognize that women are concerned with all the things we've talked about, but they were also very aware of politics. They were aware of that bigger picture. They knew what the news was just as much as everyone else did. And when the Anglo-Indian War broke out, um, sometimes it's referred to as Pontiac's War or Pontiac's Rebellion, um, when that event happened, women absolutely were paying attention. There was a religious revival going on. A lot of folks were, think, were feeling like they needed to leave some of those British things. Um, they needed to go back to their, their traditional lifestyles. Um, but women were a part of that as well. And we sometimes, again, focus on the, the military side of it, but what's happening in these families? Um, when Michelin Mackinac was attacked, as were many forts in 1763, the way it happened, which I'm sure many people have heard of, was um, pretty clever. Um, there was a game that was happening outside the palisade. The warriors that were playing this game were using it as a distraction. They called the British soldiers and said, hey, watch this game. They threw a ball near the fort when they did that, their wives and their daughters and their sisters had weapons hidden under their clothing or under blankets, and they were able to pass those off. And the men, their brothers and their fathers, were able to attack the fort, and they were very successful. The whole thing happened quite quickly. Um, but what's important, the British were gone. They were captured or massacred during this this event. But what's important is to recognize that the women that were there hiding weapons under their clothing, they had just as much a part of that battle as, as the fellas did. If the 
tides had turned and the British were able to push away those native people, the women would have likely have been in just as much danger as the men were. So, you know, they're making those choices. What is best for my family? What is best for my community? And they're following through with them. So when we're thinking about that attack on Michelle and Mackinac from their perspective, really kind of changes a little bit how we see it. And we do want to try to look at things from as many angles as we can. After the British left Michilimackinac, um, they were able to come back about a year later and there were some policies put in place. They said that women, native women specifically, could not spend the night in the fort. Um, they had a couple of other things going on, but they, they knew that they, um, they had a part in the battle. In, in the attack. So it's important to recognize that they, they yes, were involved in the fur trade, but they're also aware of what's happening in the bigger picture. So um, we're gonna talk about the next group of people. And I do tend to break things up into groups just because it's easier for my brain to, to recognize it. But indigenous people, the Odawa and Ojibwe and Potawatomi are here the whole time. Um, but in 1715, when the French start building the fort at the Straits. There were French soldiers, um, but very quickly after the fort was established, we started to see fur traders and French women also coming to the Straits of Mackinac. So what I like to ask myself is why the heck would a French lady leave Montreal where there are nice paved streets, um, <laughs> there are shops, there are there's entertainment. Um, you probably have family and friends. Why the heck would you come all the way out to Michilimackinac to a teeny tiny fort? Um, and the answer really comes down to economics. Um, in most instances, some of the ladies didn't have a choice, but most of them did. And it was largely because of money. So we're going to take a, a look at some of those French ladies. Um, and the first one that I want to talk about is one of the first ones that we have documented as coming into the Straits of Mackinac. Um, her name, of course, um, if you study French colonial history or study French history in Michigan, the names can get kind of complicated because a lot of people are named the same thing and they recycle those same names um, amongst their families. Um, so it can get complicated, but this lady, Marie-Francois Alavoie Chevalier, came to Michelin-Mackinac just in 1718. So again, the fort is established in 1715, so just three years later. You can imagine going from a sandy rocky beach, these soldiers toss up some buildings. Um, I'm sure they were sturdy because they were there year round, but it's a pretty rough I think at first. I do want to say the waterways, the Great Lakes, um, didn't mean we were isolated. So you could get anything that you could put in a canoe at Michel Mackinac, but it's not Montreal. <laughs> but in any case, um, Marie Francois came in 1718 by canoe with four children and her husband. We think they probably had prior ties to the fur trade. Um, while they were at Michilimackinac, they had 11 more kids, so one of those big families. Um, we know she was literate because her name shows up on vouchers signing for merchandise. Um, and again, the, the main reason we think she and her husband are coming out was to make money in the fur trade, and they absolutely did that. Um, her husband ended up traveling between Michilimackinac and Montreal quite often. And while he was gone, she would manage the business. Um, she would have been managing clerks. Some fur traders were, had, it, it varies, but one fur trader I was looking at had about 70 employees working under him around the same time period. So um, if you've ever managed people before, if you can imagine that. Most of them would have been contract workers as well. So drawing up a, a contract for them, um, she likely had clerks, but she also would have had to have managed that clerk. Um, the paperwork that's involved in the fur trade, I think we forget about sometimes, but it's significant. So she's, she's working in this fur trade business while her husband is gone. 
he died in the 1740s. She kept on in the business. Um, she stayed at Michelin Mackinac for about another 10 years. She diversified. By the time she left, we know she had at least three properties. So she was involved in real estate. We don't think she was living in all of them. She was probably renting a couple out. Um, so she was one of those really successful early fur traders at Michelin Mackinac. And she had all those kids. So um, I am always amazed by that. Um, but we also know of other women that were at Michelin Mackinac um, during this time period that were also working in the fur trade. Madame Chabalier is a really interesting lady because her name shows up in a fur trader named John Askin's papers. John Askin was the wealthiest fur trader in the Great Lakes for a while. Um, he saved a lot of his letters. He kept a diary. So we know, for example, when he planted peas in 1774, um, but in his letters, you can find that he is very clearly working with Madame Chabalier. I, I also want to mention that in a lot of these French communities, family ties were very important. Um, Chabalier was a Chevalier. <laughs> so she was a part of that big family of 15 children that all married other fur traders or married Odawa and Ojibwe and Potawatomi people, they had connections across the Great Lakes. So it really isn't that big of a surprise that John Askin was working with Madame Chevalier, Chabalier, sorry, um, because she is part of that big fur trading network. Um, these kinship ties amongst the indigenous people as well as the French people and later the British were really important. You do business with the people that you know first. Um, but this is kind of a, a snippet of one of those letters that John Askin saved um, that he had written to Madame Chabalier. And he, the, the parts that I pulled out, you're welcome to read the whole thing, but the parts that I pulled out are the parts that very clearly indicate that she is managing this business. She has her own clerks and he could have very well meant that um, it was her and her husband's clerk. Um, but uh, yeah, she, she's managing this fella. Um, Askin is also not, um, not put off that she's a woman. Sometimes our visitors at Michelin Mackinac ask us if there was a stigma with being a woman in business. I, I don't really see much evidence of that, honestly. So, um, but she, she's a really interesting fur trader. Um, she also, I should also mention during this time period, there are, there's something called the laws of coverture, which you can look up. Um, it basically puts an umbrella over a woman that's held by her husband. So women that were married, their property is basically controlled by their husbands, or in some instances, it's whichever male relative is closest to this, to them. But there are always ways around that. Um, as we saw with Madame Chevalier, her husband died. She kept up the business. She was in real estate. She bought and sold houses. No problems. With Madame Chevalier, in the 1790s, um, her husband specifically gave her power of attorney. So that's another thing to think about. What's the legality of all of this? Um, so he, he recognized that she needed to have that. He actually... Um, was gone from her again quite a bit. Um, so that was an important part of how they managed their business was to have her have that power of, all, of attorney. So she's very involved in the business. Um, but the next lady uh, is also a business lady. Um, Madame Cardon uh, is another chevalier. Um, she was a well-known community member. She's born at Michelin Mackinac. Madame uh, Cardon very likely knew multiple languages. I put that in here, but I don't exactly know that. I'm just pretty sure. Um, because she worked with the commanding officer 
who was an English speaker, and he also spoke a few languages, so it's possible they had some crossover, but most people in the Great Lakes, if they're involved in the fur trade, knew at least two languages. Um, it would have been quite difficult to manage without them, but since she grew up here, um, I, I think she probably spoke at least Odawa and French, probably English as well, possibly some of the other native languages, but in any case, she was at Michilimackinac in the 1760s, and the commanding officer, a man named Robert Rogers, who I think a lot of you have heard of as well, approached her and asked her to please take, I believe he sent two or three gallons of rum with her and another gentleman named Mr. Seeley to one of the native villages nearby. And it's unclear what Rogers says in his record as to what he wanted her to do, but we think whatever it was, she was successful because she came back to Michilimackinac and he sent her out again with more rum, more alcohol to another native village. And when we read through that, um, she came back after that second trip and she was paid as much as a laborer would have made in a whole year. And we are pretty sure he, he tells her to find what the Indians are about. We are pretty sure he's sending her out to be a spy. And that's not uncommon for the British military to use women in that way. Um, sometimes they say that if you have a soldier in your regiment who's married, um, you can send his wife out to be a spy. Um, but in this instance, it's one of the French ladies. So I know I can get a little long winded. So we will we will keep plugging along. Um, I'm really excited about all of this. So if anybody does have questions, I'll try to answer them uh, at, at the end. But um, we, we also want to not leave out those folks that are doing all the, a lot of the domestic work. Um, enslaved men and enslaved women were absolutely at Michilimackinac, as well as across the Great Lakes. Um, it's a big part of what life was if, in the time period. It wouldn't have been unusual. Um, they're working for people like Madame Chevalier and Chabalier. They're working for Madame Cardon. Any of those names that we learn about in this 18th century Michigan history, it's very likely that you can start looking around and find enslaved people attached to them. Indigenous and Black people were enslaved. Craig mentioned that at the beginning. We have looked through our records quite carefully and identified um, well over 120 individuals that were either enslaved at Michilimackinac or passed through Michilimackinac. Um, and we're working on expanding that. So we, we want to know who these folks were because they're, they're important to us. Um, a couple that show up in our records that are related to this, um, in the 1730s, there was a, a lady at Michilimackinac traveling with a fur trader named Herbatiz. I'm probably not saying that right, um, but she she was enslaved by him, and at Michilimackinac she gave birth to a baby. That baby also would have been enslaved. Her name is never mentioned, but his name was Augustine. And when the fort was attacked, uh, a woman whose recorded name is Marie, she saved, according to him, a fur trader named Alexander Henry from being um, being killed and captured. So those enslaved women are important to recognize. And a lot of those women had a big part in raising other people's children. So we're gonna talk about motherhood just a little bit. Everyone, um, whether they're native or French, they were quite often, most of the time, mothers at some point in their lives. Um, there are a lot of blended families, a lot of people, uh, there's not a good social network, of course, or a government network for, for um, protecting those people that needed extra help. So some families were not just the children of the husband blended with the children of, 
of his new wife, but also maybe kids that just needed a place to stay, um, needed help. So we see lots of families that are not just mom, dad, and kids. It's mom, dad, kids from mom, kids from dad, um, all sorts of variations. Um, but being, being a mother could be, especially if you're giving birth to your own children, could be quite dangerous. Um, there are some statistics out there. One that I saw said maybe out of every eight babies born, maybe five would live past the age of five. And I think that there can be some more study done on that as well. Um, but the reason I like to talk about motherhood specifically is that we have a, a midwife documented at Michelin Mackinac. So what is it like to give birth to a baby at a fur training fort? You know, hopefully you've got a sister or a mother or someone there to help you. The, the, the mental toll that it would take to go through a pregnancy, the, the fear that a lot of women experience, and it's, if, if you're interested, I can give you sources to look into this a little more, but um, they're experiencing the same issues that moms still do today. I don't have children, so I can't talk very specifically about it, but um, having a baby at Michelin Mackinac would have been accompanied by a midwife. And we know about at least one because of the church records. She baptized two babies because they were likely to die. So not a great story, but it does tell us that they were here. So, um, and then I'm going to talk a little bit about the military and we can kind of zip through this a little bit, but I got a question today during one of my programs with the students about how many soldiers were in Michigan. I don't know. There were 60 or 80 at Michelin Mackinac in the 1770s, and that number fluctuated, and there were soldiers scattered in various places around what would become Michigan. But what I, I would like to get at some point is who was with the soldiers? Um, because there were always people with the soldiers. Um, in the 1700s, the British military preferred in many ways, many instances, that men were not married. Um, but the common popular views of marriage really said that you weren't a man until you were married. So a regular enlisted man in the military had his officers saying, oh, no, don't get married. But pop culture is saying, oh, you're not a man unless you're married. So it, it gets really messy in that in-between world. We know that the military did allow by the 1770s about six soldiers to be married and have their wives officially recognized and the government would pay for the, those ladies. So um, they would pay for their transportation costs in most instances. They would pay for those ladies' houses in some instances. There's variation amongst regiments, but those women were with the regiment specifically for partly morale, um, but also because the officers found that they could, um, they could serve the soldiers as nurses, they could fill in those gaps that the government couldn't. They worked as nurses, sometimes petty sutlers or selling things to the soldiers, and especially laundresses. And they all had jobs to support themselves. They weren't hanging around these camps, um, taking advantage of things. They were working and they were very, um, very much able to do that in most instances. If they weren't working, officers would kick them out. Um, if their husbands died, they would lose, in some instances, their position um, as a laundress or as a settler. So um, it's important to recognize that the soldiers that came to Michelin Mackinac, out of the two companies that were there in the 1770s, probably had, could have had 12 ladies, maybe more, maybe less. We have no idea how many children there would have been. Um, those records just aren't there but we can look at what's happening in other places, but um, they were there. Um, so we know some of their names. Again, I do like to say names when I can. Um, Elizabeth, we know specifically was a laundress. Um, Mrs. John Savage was married to the tailor. Uh, John Savage was a tailor. Um, Mrs. Bromad, she was the wife of an artillery man. And Mrs. Thomas Carlyle, her husband was a sergeant. So we know a few of them. 
And we also know a few of the um, officers' wives. Um, this is Mrs. Rogers. We talked about Robert Rogers earlier. Um, she, we have a painting of her. This was done around the time that she was married, somewhere around 1761. So really special to have an image of a lady that lived at Michelin Mackinac. Um, she's quite lovely. But when her and her husband were first married, they wrote really, really gushy love letters. He called her his dearest dear. And I believe in one of the letters, it says that um, she made him a prisoner to love. So really what I want someday. Um, but their marriage, and this is why I like to talk about her, their marriage did not last forever. Um, he and she had had problems just like marriages do today and eventually they got divorced. So divorce is something that women could experience. Um, and then the other officer's wife that we know of at Michelle Mackinac was named Rebecca de Peister, Rebecca Blair de Peister. We do have an image of her later in life. Um, I didn't include it though. Instead, I included this picture of her garden. Um, but she was Scottish and did not leave a lot of writings herself. Um, we know a lot about her from her husband though. Their relationship seemed to be quite solid. Um, he, her husband was the commanding officer of the fort. Um, they moved around quite a lot. They were always together. Um, they originally met when he was stationed um, over in Europe. And she, his background was pretty upper class, as was hers. And so when they came to Michelin Mackinac, they brought that with them. Um, she had a servant named Susan. She may also have been enslaved. We don't quite know how what her role was in their household, but um, she was an upper class lady living at Michelin Mackinac. She made friends. Um, we know about a little about her through the Askins as well. And then after they left Michelin Mackinac, um, they ended up retiring in Scotland. And this couple never had children. So we talked about those folks that had all those kids. Some people didn't have any children. So we, we see that today as well. So I like to try to try to let folks know that um, when we're doing our programs as well. But the biggest thing I do want people to take away with when we're talking about women is that they were not sitting by at home in the kitchen taking care of their kids and cooking and cleaning. Um, they were there in every place, wherever we look in our history at Michelin Mackinac or anywhere else, um, they were present. And when we're looking at those primary sources, they're often doing work that's comparable to anyone else in the community. Um, we do, again, also want to remember the nuance and I get questions quite often, you know, were there women here? And I always ask, what women are you thinking of? Because we have that vision in our mind. If I were to ask you that, you know, if you think of an 18th century woman, what are you thinking of? Um, you know, we want to remember that they came in all sorts of different versions, just like they do today. So I guess that's about all I want to talk about. I do talk for a long time. So Craig, if you have anything else that you want to bring into the program or wrap things up, um, we might have a few questions we can answer as well. I will let you go ahead. Uh, yeah, I, I see we do have some questions in the chat. Um, you know, just as Le Leanne said, you know, uh, I think that's a, a, a really important part of what we're trying to do. As I mentioned, we're trying to interpret the entire community. So sometimes, you know, some of the the male roles appear to be more highly visible. You know, I usually interpret a soldier, so I've got a nice red coat on and it's highly visible. And that's maybe what people think is all, all that's here, but it's not, there's so much more than that. There are um, almost invariably more civilian women than there are ever soldiers here. And that's in addition to women associated with the military who, um, uh, I know we don't have good numbers on them, but there were probably a lot more than was officially allowed um, because they're supposed to only be, as Leah mentioned, like six per company of 50 or so men. 
So by regulation, there should only be 12 here. There's almost certainly more than that. Uh, when the 8th Regiment left Canada, uh, when they left the Great Lakes in 1785, uh, people watching them uh, go downriver to, to embark, uh, to go back to, to Britain, noted the number of women and especially children. These observers said they must have bred like rabbits while they were out here. Um, so, I mean, there's, that's, that's a whole community in, in, in and of itself. And you can extrapolate what's going on at Michelin Mackinac at Detroit. Um, you know, Detroit is, uh, has a permanent population of a couple thousand people by the 1770s. There's another small European community at Sault Ste. Marie. Um, there's another small European community at what we call Niles today, what they would have called St. Joseph. In all those places, there are men and women of all different backgrounds, whether they are Anishinaabek or French or British, and they're all linked together in some way. Uh, you know, another, like, you know, kind of interesting person that uh, 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 Leanne kind of touched on, you know, John Askin, and, and some of the things you do have to look in the negative spaces of the historic record to find those women, um, because some of Askin's kind of, I guess, trading partners, they were kind of working for him, uh, were the Barths who had, who maintained the trading station at Sault Ste. Marie. They're his brothers-in-law. He married their sister. Um, and you don't see a whole lot about her necessarily, but she's the one who kind of makes him able to experience that success uh, in, uh, in just that one facet of his business. So we're, we're very lucky that we have good concrete records for a lot of these, these people that Leanne touched on. And then again, if you look in the right place and you look at it in the right way, you can start to see a whole lot of other people. You know, some of the soldiers' wives that Leanne was mentioning, we, we just see their name once, but we can see a whole lot about them just by extrapolating, well, what are other women in the military doing? We know, like, for instance, Mrs. Bromed, that, uh, the, that artillery soldier's uh, uh, wife, she, not he, she appears in the historic record because she got called to Montreal to go testify at a court martial. So she was called as a witness, not him. Um, you know, so the, these people have a, a really rich lives, even if we can't really see them. And it just takes a little bit more digging to, to take care of that. But I guess we can um, jump into some questions if we want. I don't know if how we want to do that. I mean, I've got the chat pulled up. Um, I guess we can start reading them and uh, maybe Leanne can answer. So I, I guess we've got a question. Where would I be able to find source material for Marie Constance Cardin and the duties she performed for Robert Rogers? Yeah, Cardans, um, I was actually going back and looking that, at that earlier. It's, Craig might know exactly, it's in Roger's papers. Um, he, he pretty, and I think, are those accessible online or do we have, we have a library in Mackinac City, so we have some records that we can just go and look at. Um, do you, there, I can't remember if she is mentioned in the trial transcript because what yes. what yes. what Leanne kind of talked around, um, you know, a lot of people <laughs> know who Robert Rogers is, you know, Rogers Rangers, and maybe you saw the the movie with Spencer Tracy or the really bad turn TV show that he appears in. Um, Michelin Mackinac is his undoing. Uh, he gets accused of treason and colluding with the French here, and uh, Elizabeth plays a role in, in the court proceedings, whether you know they were investigating, was she colluding with him? It's all made up. That's all trumped up charges. It, none of it's really true. Um, but she is involved in, in his trial. Uh, and so there's instances there, again, not only of what Elizabeth was doing, but of, um, you know, in terms of going out and potentially spying, but other things that she's doing, there's notes about her teaching a, a French Canadian man, um, English. She's teaching uh, Joseph Louis Ans, who is an interpreter here, teaching him English basically out of a, a grammar. That's what it says. She's teaching him English out of a grammar. So she basically has a school book that she's teaching him out of. 
Um, so that would be a good place to start. I know Mackinac State Historic Parks publishes the, that trial transcript as a book called Treason at Michelin Mackinac. It's got a question mark in the middle. Um, but yeah, Roger's papers are out there. Again, he's pretty famous um, and, and you can probably find it there. Uh, Leanne, another question. As a woman studying women's history, has there been anything you've learned or discovered during your time at MSHP that made you proud of the women or uh, the woman or women you've been studying or particularly excited to learn about? I appreciate that question so much. Um, yes, always. Uh, I have been for months, I think now, Craig, um, interested in a woman that was very briefly at Michelin Mackinac named Sally or Sarah Ants, And she was Oneida, probably. And she came to Michelin Mackinac because of trade as a single lady. I believe she had her child with her. Um, she held her own household. Um, and then she had a relationship with a British soldier. And um, I think we might have a blog post coming about this, coming out about this at some point, but she basically was not willing to put up with this British soldier and kicked him to the curb. Um, after he proposed an odd thing to her. So when I, when I hear stories like that, I'm like, yes, absolutely. Do not put up with men's crap um, if you can, can avoid it. But um, one thing I, I didn't really talk about, and I try to in our tours, if the audience is, a, is old enough, but one thing that is interesting in our records is when we find instances where women may be quite obviously had a disadvantage. And I talked about um, that list of, of British women. There was also another lady at Michelin Mackinac named Mrs. Oldham, and she probably was a servant, maybe, we don't really know. Um, but she had a daughter who was possibly abused by another man at Michelin Mackinac. So when I hear things like that, I'm also, um, you know, not proud, not excited, but I'm, I'm really interested to see how the community responded to that. And we don't know much about that incident in particular, but, you know, any, anything that I hear about, um, you know, related to women at Michelin Mackinac or even in Michigan, honestly, during this time period, um, I think is exciting because it can be overlooked sometimes, but Craig might have more details about those instances. He's got a better history memory than I do. Um, yeah, but. I'd just say, yeah, if you're interested in Sally Ahns, um, you know, she is big in Canadian history. She owned at one time uh, a lot of what is now Southwestern Ontario uh, and yeah. unfortunately had it all taken from her. She was dealing with Joseph Brandt. I can't remember if she's related to him. Um, I I don't know if she's related, but she worked as a translator and she spoke up like she she worked pretty closely with him and um, she was also working with John Askin at, at certain points and she I, Yeah, she's really interesting to me and I, I wish that we we knew more about her. But she's definitely someone where you even because we're, we're getting a lot of info about her from the, the man, a man named Maxwell, who was the commissary here. So he was kind of a civilian contractor. Uh, and he writes, um, it, it kind of sounds like they were both madly in love with one another and also always at one another's throats. Um, and, and Maxwell had a really like well thought of career in the French and Indian War and also had a good career in the Rev War. And then she's just like, no, I've had enough. <laughs> Uh, okay, a couple other questions. Are there records at the library in Mackinac City available to the public uh, when pandemic is over? Yes, typically they are. Um, we're, our office and library is closed to the public at the moment, but typically, uh, yes, it is. And if you have specific research requests, um, we can handle those remotely between me, Leanne, our registrar, um, and so on. Uh, Jeff, hi Jeff, um, asks, mm -hmm. Did the geographic isolation, interconnection, and influences of the Native community at the fort change women's unique opportunities not afforded them uh, in, say, Montreal or New York during this period? What do you think? Um, I feel like people were more likely to maybe not stick exactly to the rules. 
However, we see instances where they are. So I, I, I don't know. Something to think about. Yeah, you know, potentially it's a little bit easier again, just because of the, um, it's a, it's a big network, but it's still very intimate in terms of family relations, you know, because as, as Leanne mentioned, a lot of instances, oh, uh, your husband died, you're in charge now. And it's not just, you know, oh, well, you're, you're out of the business. Um, you know, Magdalene Lafamboise, who Leanne mentioned, uh, that absolutely happens to her uh, in the early 19th century. Her husband um, was murdered in, I think, 1806. Uh, and she just took over the business uh, and became very wealthy uh, and very um, uh, a, a leader of the Mackinac Island community. This is after the communities over there. And so potentially in instances like that, there's maybe a little bit more opportunity, but I don't think that gender roles were nearly as well defined as they are stereotyped to be today. Um, oh no, there's so many businesses that women owned, so many. You can go, you can Google like trade cards, women trade cards, 18th century and come up with a ton. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so I guess one kind of uh, last question we can, or one or two. So a little mention of religion, the Jesuits, the English evangelicals and their impact uh, on Indian people. What was their impact or attitude to women? So Leanne, if you want to start, I can sort of chime in. Um, yeah, I, I, I don't know. I don't know. Most of what I have looked at related to religion has been, I, I, I've look, I'm interested in education, whoops, sorry. Um, and sometimes we see women or, or children of both genders being sent from Michelin Mackinac to go to school in Montreal. Um, there was one woman uh, at the fort, her name was Catherine, who went to live with the nuns. We're not sure which nuns in Montreal um, when she was thir 13, I believe. And she came back to Michelin Mackinac when she was 15 and then got married. Um, so, so we see that. Um, hi, yeah, th there's, there's some of it happening in the 18th century, but it really, I think, gets pushed forward in the 19th century. Um, yeah. It, we see women's names, you know, standing in as godmother quite often, but I sometimes wonder how, how, um, how that is, if they're standing in that position because they're incredibly devout women, or if they're there because it's maybe somebody they know and they've got those family or business connections. I don't, I don't know. Craig, you can. Yeah, you know, you know uh, being a primarily French Canadian community, you know, well into the 19th century, um, you know, everybody is at least, or most people are nominally Catholic. Um, I say nominally because the, the level of devotion seems to ebb and flow, you know, by the 1770s, the Bishop of Quebec, so not an impartial outside observer, is basically saying that religion, the Catholic religion, is a hollow shell in Canada. Everybody goes through the motions, um, says, yes, obviously I'm Catholic, but no one has like, at least in his mind, you know, really deep belief. Um, I will say, you know, everybody does, whether or not they, they deeply hold those beliefs, they do go through the motions though. That's one of the ways that we have such good records for a lot of these people, both men and women, is via the church records. Uh, the, the Church of St. Anne, which is still an active parish on Mackinac Island today, um, you know, as people were getting married, uh, as children were being baptized, uh, as uh, people were dying and, and being buried, you start to see those family connections. I guess I would say religion probably has the most outsized impact upon enslaved people, um, and particularly enslaved women, because for a variety of reasons, uh, the French, both the, the native people, the French and the British really did prefer enslaved women and especially enslaved children um, for a variety of reasons, um, just because they're easier to acculturate if you uh, basically remove a child from their, their culture when they're still young. Uh, and under French law, 
uh, slaveholders were required to provide religious education to any enslaved people that they own. Uh, and so that's how we, we run across a lot of those enslaved people here is via church records. We can see their names. We don't know what their real names were, what their original names were. We can only see the names that somebody else gave them. Um, but they're having children here. But even there, they're retaining a pretty high or at least some agency because some of those children um, that they're having, they, are, they will not name the father. Uh, and whether that is because they fear retribution, whether they are protecting the father, um, you know, whether that relationship was consensual or most likely not, um, you know, they are, uh, you know, having those children baptized uh, because um, it's, it's in some ways required of them, but in other ways, it is a way for them to kind of claim that child as their own rather than, you know, that child just being uh, taken away from them, which unfortunately it still happened a lot. You know, the child might be baptized and then removed and just gifted away. We, we see that a few times where children are presented as uh, uh, gifts um, to, to other traders, uh, the children of enslaved mothers. Um, you know, in terms of other religions, you don't see uh, evangelical Protestantism out here. That's that's kind of like the hot new thing in British society by the 1770s and the 1780s. Um, we don't really see a lot of it here. Uh, there's no English clergy here. There isn't French Canadian Catholic clergy here after 1765. Um, so again, it does seem to be one of those things where everyone says, yep, I'm, I am Catholic. I am Anglican, but to a point, <laughs> um, at least in, in, in our reading of it. Um, uh, yeah, I guess that's the, the last kind of history question. Somebody asked us, what, what are we doing in 2021 for, um, you know, just our general operation? Um, we're, we'll be open. We're opening at Michelin Mackinac on May 5th. Uh, you know, we'll have, uh, some precautions in place. We've, uh, ended a lot of our indoor programs where people come in and sit down. Uh, but in place of that, we've moved everything outside. Um, so in, in many ways, you're going to get the same content, maybe just in a slightly different spot. Um, you know, that we found that worked pretty well for us last year, was able to keep people safe and still provide that information. And that's what we're looking to do again this year. And I know a lot of people will also be going to the island and we have a new exhibit at the Biddle that talks a lot about indigenous treaty rights as well as um, Agatha Biddle a bit? So yeah, so kind of, uh, you know, we kind of ended, we talked about a couple generations of Mackinac women tonight, kind mm -hmm. of the next generation. So um, their children remain just as active in the community and especially in the economy here. Um, and in many ways become even more prominent as you move into the early 19th century. And so the Mackinac Island Native American Museum at the Biddle House <laughs> talks more about that, talks about, you know, Madeline Laframbois, about some of her contemporaries, um, and especially a woman named Agatha Biddle, who was um, probably Odawa, potentially um, part Odawa and part French Canadian, but probably all Anishinaabe. Uh, and she and her husband were heavily involved in the fur trade and we use them as a lens through which to view all the stuff that's going on in the 1830s because there's a bunch of stuff and how that still impacts indigenous communities today. All right, well, thank you so much. I think I could speak for everyone. This was an amazing presentation. I think I could sit here and listen for about these stories another couple of hours personally. Um, it makes me very excited to um, make it up to Mackinac this summer. It sounds like a lot of other people would love to come up there and join as well. So um, I couldn't end the presentation without doing a shameless plug. Uh, we will be having more Zoom presentations. Um, so check out our website. We are also inviting guests back to the museum here starting in April and May in small tour capacities. So if you're um, vaccinated and ready to rock and want to come out and visit us, we will be starting to open our doors here soon in the next couple of months.
And as always, presentations like this we're able to offer for free because of the support of our members. So thank you to those who are members. If you're not a member, um, you can visit our website and consider um, joining up, helping. Um, we have a lot of construction going on, exhibits coming out and programs, and we can only do that because of our members here at the museum. So thank you so much for joining us tonight. Thank you to our special guests, Craig and Lee Ann, um, and we look forward to working with you again in the future. So have a great night, everybody. Yeah, thanks for having us.